the take home message I want for everyone is that this statement, building physics for comfort, is for me a, a lifetime aim, but it should be also for everyone. And if you write nothing else down, then you should write this down. Because buildings is for comfort, and buildings, how you do that is through physics. And um, <laughs> I think uh, the truth <laughs> should actually you know, be pages of physics. So, um, oh, is it going? Oh, oh, yes, it was. So this is a lot of things I do, which is not interesting at all. Um, but how I get there is probably far more interesting. As I said, building physics has become a life quest. Um, when I was two years old, I got knocked over. I didn't understand why I fell over. The conversation with my mum kind of went like this. What happened? Why did I fall over? Nothing, nothing. It's okay, my darling, nothing had happened. What do you mean, nothing? It's just a gust of wind. Oh. So I started from the age of two asking why. Um, and in my mother tongue, why is dim guy? How do you explain? I wasn't happy with nothing pushed me over. There was something that pushed me over. I didn't just fall over. So from the comfort of my home, I looked out of the window, watched the leaves, and think about what is wind. And if anything, I'd like to invite you to be curious about your surroundings like that two-year-old me. And a lot of people, as soon as you mention building physics, they go, <laughs> and they don't want to attempt to even get anywhere near it. But what I want you to try and be is not to say, I'm doing building physics. I want you to be curious. And um, I was so curious, we went traveling to Las Vegas when I was eight, and I saw the Milky Way, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So my parents actually was very, very generous. They actually paid for me to go to the Space Museum in Hong Kong then to do a course. It was actually a course for adults. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I was sitting there going, oh, what is this? It was general relativity. And I was trying really hard. I was drawing lines on a piece of paper, folding it, scrunching up, tossing it in the air, and then looked at the guy next to me. And he said, don't ask me. I don't understand either. <laughs> but I think you will. So what that has um, put into my mind until today is that it's not always necessary or important to understand all the symbols on the page and all the mathematical equations, which is hard. Um, but that conceptually, how critically uh, things logically affect each other, the causal effect of things, and basic explanations and, and finding facts to then fit into understanding is far more important. Every day is a school day, and I still go to school every day now, trying to uh, do my, finish my PhD part-time um, whilst doing lots of work. Um, but I really enjoyed school, and I think geography and physics is something that is actually really taken to me because I'm so curious about my surroundings. And how we interact with this earth is really important now more than ever. And being a school, going to school every day, I realized, especially being an imposter at chemical engineering course, um, 
in Edinburgh University, sitting up, up across the desk from Professor Stefano in a tutorial. Um, I don't know, the slides moved on here, but not there. I um, was definitely an imposter. I didn't understand a thing about what this tutorial meant to do. And then he was like trying to get me to answer this question. And, um, oh, there we go, it's finally turned up. And um, I then racked my brains and sheepishly wrote this down. And then this smile came across the professor's face and uh, with a bit of a sigh of relief, I suppose, I don't know, I, don't, I kind of then worked out the rest of the, 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 the thing. And I realized, actually, you could go to lectures about isotherms and, I don't know, Fourier transform and blah, 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 blah. But actually, the fundamentals are the most important. Things that I learned back in my school day. And those concepts work both in macro scale and micro scale. And it just takes that little leap of faith to go from an imposter to, actually, I might understand a little bit. So, so I want to invite you to think about why we build. Why is it that we build? What's the whole point? Why are we using all this carbon? Why are we doing all this? Because we want to protect ourselves from the environment. You know, I, I, I said to mum I want to go home having fallen over because of the wind because home protects me, keeps me safe. And um, this is, and um, the um, environment, we have sun, rain, you know, wind, you know, the, the effects of seasons, weather, all of that, that we want to shelter ourselves from. And we want to have comfort and well-being. This is Danish word, hygge, which has been uh, in the, um, it's not changing the slides. It's not changing. That conveys the mood of coziness, wellness, and contentment. How do we achieve that? That is the ultimate aim, right? That is what buildings are doing for us. So we want to control temperature, humidity, air quality security, and very importantly, control. If we have control over our environment, our comfort zone increases. Again, it's not changing, so I don't know why. Anyway, so the comfort zone is a zone. It's not just a dot, right? Even though my Tado app tells me it's not comfortable until it's 20 degrees and it won't turn orange, it'll stay green as long as it's 18 degrees. Um, no, actually, I am quite comfortable at 18, thank you very much. Um, people will feel comfortable in a wider range, still not changing, in a wider range when they're able to control the environment, where they're able to open the windows, close the windows, they're less likely to get sick building syndrome. And the balance in achieving that comfort, you know, not too hot, not too cold, managing the microclimate from the macroclimate and all the considerations thereof. So this question of balance. So how do we explain our buildings? What is it that we do? Oh, thermodynamics, what a big word. Control, heat, cold, simple. Fluid dynamics. We don't want to live in a plastic bag. But like one of the founders of Cedar says, Howard Little, who says, build tight, ventilate right. However, everybody says, take in the first bit of building tight and forgot about the last bit. Whereas actually the last bit is probably more important. Ventilate right. And what is right? Not too much. Not too little. Of course, you don't want drafts. 
But also, I actually had a client. I, I said, oh, your, your loft needs, you know, ventilation so that it doesn't get moldy, you can store things there and all that. Then he decided to add double the amount of ventilation uh, slots than I have specified. Well, giving him the kudos, he actually did monitor the humidity and temperature as I, as I asked him to. He then realized, oh yeah, I just made my loft like the outside. So it's not that useful, is it? Um, so then he blocked up the vent that I didn't specify. So there is the correct amount of ventilation to be thought about. And of course, as Bill was mentioning as well, there's water, moisture considerations. Um, both liquid water and water vapor. And um, there's, there's the uh, Greek and Latin roots, hydro being liquid and hydro being vapor. And how it works in the building and in the fabric. But out of all those previous slides, the key word is dynamic. Dynamic just means that it's not static. How things flow. And how do we achieve a balance under constant dynamical systems? Because none of it is, is static. And that's where physics come in. This is a really um, uh, important book when it comes up. Water Transport in Brick, Stone and Concrete. It's my Bible for my PhD, actually. Written by uh, one of my external supervisors. And um, there we go. And in it, actually, I, this is the second edition that I've got a hard copy of, but the third edition has come up and I have uh, influenced, I suppose, um, a bit of the content, which, uh, there we go, which is the state of the cavity wall, because I feel that it's really, really important that we understand that. Um, the cavity is created for a reason. And um, with two hours of rainfall, it gets the outer leaf gets saturated. So what is happening to the cavity? It is designed to wick water, to have a cavity drain, weep holes, ties that have drip tips. And if we retrofill it with anything, doesn't have to be beads, anything at all. What happens? This is taken from a retrofill website uh, uh, supplier. They say, oh, it's perfectly fine. 95% of the water will actually drain down and, and exit anyway. What happens to the 5%? When the external leaf is saturated, the, inter the, the internal side of the external leaf is at 100% relative humidity. Very high water vapor. Where is it going? The cavity is now no longer vented. It will eventually diffuse and go towards the inside. It's inevitable. It might take 10 years because diffusion is a very, very slow process. A sample this size takes about a week. So, you know, it takes a long time, but that's what happens. So the manufacturer claims that it's fine, but does it really work? I have actually in my um, work taken out a lot of ca previously filled cavities. And there are reports out there that shows that it doesn't work. Of course, there are better evaporative potentials for south facing, you know, whatever, you know, and it could take even longer for it to actually go through. But there are scientific calculations that support what I'm saying here. Frustratingly, EPC makes people do it. Unless they do it, they don't get funding. Oh, dear. 
Oh well. But what I want to impart to you in the last minute of my um, talk is really, can you also explain every part of your home? And I think that's where building physics is for everyone. The wasp that built the nest knew every single bit of wood that is collected and made, made its home from. Every pilot knows that every plane has its manual logbook and everything. Do we have the building equivalent of BPE manual, the rebuild or change of parts of boilers or whatever you have? We should. Because our home is for our comfort and our well-being, for our health. How can we not know how to do it? And it's our, the adaptation of our environment is what the building is doing, which supports healthy, happy and quality of life. Because we have to amalgam all those things that is surrounding our homes in order to have a holistic approach to our um, living. I want to talk about a little bit about adaptive comfort as in how we sail our home. Just as we are going out to see the boat is the only thing that takes us from, you know, safely from A to B. We need to know how to adjust everything to fight the waves and the weather. So we actually want to know exactly how to, to tune our sails to the wind, adjust our rudder to, to point the right direction, and understanding physics actually allows us to do this for our homes, to improve comfort, have low energy adaptations, appropriate controls, reduce risk of mold, moisture, and all that sort of stuff, and increase resilience, because it will, as Bill has said, reduce our energy demand, help us actually survive for longer for less. This is from the news just on Wednesday and this is why I, I personally want everybody, not just me, to have used building physics to understand how we can achieve comfort. Um, to practically solve the problem. Oh, this is why I am teaching now building physics to everybody, just basics up. I mean, if, you, if you've got your passive house, then um, that's it really. Um, don't worry about that, but, whoops. But yeah, um, if you come from a place where you've done English and, and uh, English literature and history of art or whatever and want to understand a little bit about your home, then um, the course is definitely open for you. And I would just want to end with this um, and ask that everybody to try and adjust their sails. Um, as if your home is your boat. Know every single part of it, know how to open and close, when to open and close the windows, turn on and off the heating and all that sort of things to be comfortable. Thank you. I've just finished watching I Am Greta on the television and my eyes are literally filled with tears. And, and that's because I'm experiencing the same, the same anger, frustration, possible sense of hopelessness when it comes to the place, pace of climate change action. And for me, that's been for the last 20 years. And I decide at that point um, to draw a line in the sand and do what I can do um, to, make, to make the biggest difference I can. Now, Seven years before this teary scene, I was sitting in that, in that same living room and I had just moved in to my new 125 year old home. Um, and it was a cold and dark Halloween evening. And the first thing that my mind went to was how am I going to make this a better place to live? So that is improving my thermal comfort, lowering my energy consumption, and of course, um, having a big impact on, on CO2. 
And of course, my mind and my methodology instantly went to um, how I've been working as a, as a whole building, building services engineer. Um, so when you're designing a building with a blank piece of paper, things like orientation, form and fabric, the, these things can be, you can design these things on a piece of paper and essentially they can be almost free and they can have the biggest impact on what the CO2 um, impact of that building is going to be. And once we've nailed those things, we then think about really good mechanical and electrical services and then adding in some renewables. But of course, as we talked about, in an existing building, the orientation, the form, all that stuff is already fixed. So in my home, I got to work. I got to work on the easy win um, fabric, and fabric improvements that I could make. So these things were draft proofing around windows and doors, adding attic installation, fixing that wonky attic hatch, and, and just generally getting on with all the maintenance that, that needed to be done um, over the past 100 years. So during this process of me upgrading, upgrading my house, um, my boiler packed in after the first, first couple of years. And I immediately went out and I replaced my old non-condensing gas combi boiler with a brand new condensing gas boiler with some really, really nice weather compensated, compensated controls. And, and overnight that, that dropped the CO2 emissions associated with my, my heating system by about, by about 15%. And I was, you know, I was, uh, I was quite happy with that. Excuse me. And then after that, I get on with my, my deep retrofit plans. Now, I really, I really love the way my house looks. Um, that's one of the reasons that I, I bought it and I live there. Um, so my deep retrofit plan was, um, or is, internal insulation with secondary, secondary glazing. But as soon as I start this process, something becomes um, incredibly clear to me. And that is just how incredibly slow the process is. Um, it's not only incredibly slow, because I'm doing most of the work myself, um, it's, it, it's also incredibly dirty and messy. You've got 125 years of dust and soot built up behind those walls, and the moment you touch them, it gets, it gets, av it gets absolutely everywhere. It's also incredibly disruptive. You know, you're, you're living in a house with a family, and you're taking entire rooms out of action um, in one go, and organising your life around that is, is not, not trivial. And the third thing is, it is really expensive. And not just for the insulation materials, but also um, to redecorate afterwards, and then obviously to reinstore any sort of period features, such as sort of plaster cornice that you might have um, you might have damaged in the in the process. But you know, I had my plan, and I was I was implementing my plan. I was getting on with it. Um, I reckon I might be finished working my way round the house by about 2040, and then in 2040, perhaps I think I'm ready for some sort of alternative form form of heating. But, you know, I'm back in that room, it's 2021, and I'm deciding my plan that I've been implementing is no longer, is no longer good enough. And I want to, I want to describe to you why, why I changed my mind. So two numbers you often hear, you often hear them in the same, the same paragraph, the same sentence, perhaps even the same headline, is 1.5 degrees of warming and net zero 2050. And you'd be totally forgiven to think that these, these numbers are, are, are connected. Um, sadly, they are, they are absolutely not. Um, the, the level of atmospheric CO2 concentration that will result in a 1.5 degree warming is going gonna, is gonna to occur in just under, just under six years' time. That's, that's, not, that's not 2050, that's not 27 years' time, that's, that's under six. And so there's a real, real sense of urgency. And that's because once you put carbon into the atmosphere, it is incredibly difficult um, to reverse that and take it back out. It's a bit like if we think about putting carbon into the atmosphere, like putting water into this, into this bathtub. Um, the, the plug hole is what nature takes out. And we, we, nature's been doing a good job of taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And we don't really know how, many, how close some of those natural systems are to complete saturation. There are lots of technological solutions on the table. Um, basically, every country in the world um, is completely dependent on finding technological solutions to take carbon out of the atmosphere. But at this point in time, those solutions do not exist and they cannot be scaled on anything like, um, anything like we need. So what we have to do is we have to take hold of that tap and we have to turn it off as quickly as we possibly can. And when you look at a house like mine, you have to look at the numbers and you have to, you have to accept that the gas that I'm burning to heat my, my home and to generate hot water is responsible for 78% of the, 
of the carbon emissions of my home. So if I don't, if I don't do something about that, I'm only ever going to be tinkering around, around the edges. So in 2021, and indeed now, what are my options for reducing the carbon emissions of, of the heat? Well, I could burn wood, um, but this would make things worse. With the CO2 going up the chimney, worse than if I was burning coal. I could get a hydrogen ready boiler, um, but green hydrogen doesn't exist. It probably never will. And even if it does, it'll be super expensive. The electricity grid is getting greener all the time, um, but electricity is expensive. So if I was to heat my home using direct electric radiators, I would I very quickly uh, bankrupt myself, which left me my only real choice for electrifying my heat and decarbonizing was to use was to use a heat pump. And that's because heat pumps, in my opinion, are almost magic. They'll give you four times the heat out than the electricity you put in. So, so you, get, so you pay for one unit of electricity and you get four units of, of heat. I mean, that, that's big. If I was to offer you a car that went four times further on the same tank of fuel or the same battery charge you know, than you paid for, you would absolutely bite my hand off. Absolutely bite my hand off for that. So I get to work, heat pumps it is, um, and I carve out a corner of my kitchen um, in order to store my domestic hot water cylinder and my heat pump, heat pump controls. I also replace all the um, pipe work in my house. It's all, it's all very old, um, it's all microbore copper. It has been battered into the skirting boards for 30 years of vigorous vacuum cleaning. Um, and it is in dire need of replacement. I replace some of my radiators, um, not all of them, but some of them. Some of them needed replaced because they'd, they'd, uh, they'd started to, to deteriorate and, and leak. So by November 2021, the heat pump was installed and we had a couple of happy, happy customers. Now, I want to say a little quick word on funding on all of this and, and acknowledge while the world might not be perfect, we here in Scotland are much, much more fortunate than, than our friends and colleagues south of the border. So in England, you are eligible for the boiler upgrade scheme, which will give you a whole £5,000 to replace your gas boiler with a heat pump, which is, you know, quite frankly, laughable. In Scotland, you will get a £7,500 um, grant and with the option to top that up by another two and a half thousand pounds. So you can, you can immediately get access to 10,000 pounds worth, worth of funding um, to do these things, which, which may, may not cover the whole cost for everyone, but it is, it is a lot of the way there. And it means that it's not just for people that have thousands and thousands of pounds lying around waiting to, to do something with. Now I want to talk about obviously the carbon savings that heat pumps um, provide. But before I do that, I want to have a little look at busting some or smashing some heat pump, heat pump myths. So the, the, the first thing is that a heat pump can only be installed and it will only work in a very well insulated home. Well, as an engineer, I could, I, could design, I could design a really efficient heat pump system to work in the most uninsulated of homes. But I can guarantee you one thing, you're not gonna like the size of the radiators that are required in order for that heat pump to be efficient in a very uninsulated home. Now, so to control the size of the radiators, we're going to want to focus on those easy wins. What I want to stress the point here is it's, we don't require deep retrofit for this, but you do require the easy wins, the good maintenance. So the topping up of the, of the loft insulation, the looking at where the drafts are coming from, um, that sort of thing. The second thing is that heat pumps are incredibly noisy uh, and everyone's going to need earplugs when, when, we, all have, when we all have heat pumps. Um, my experience is when I stand next to my heat pump, I can't hear it over the noise that my neighbour's boiler flue is generating. So we're, we're, we're in this, we're not, modern domestic heat pumps are incredibly, incredibly quiet. And the third thing, and I think this is probably, probably the, most, the most damaging thing to the rollout of heat pumps, is, is just what you might hear is they just won't work. They don't work. They, they, they can't make your radiators hot enough, um, especially in a historic home, um, to, to make you warm. All I can say is I can speak for myself, and I know I have the permission to speak for my, my wife, uh, is over the last two, some, two winters, sorry, we have never been more comfortable in our home. So why is that? And that's because a heat pump is a, is a lot like a fridge. Um, you don't just switch your fridge on when you want a cold drink. You, it's on and it's enabled and it does its thing to make sure your drinks are, are always cold. And, and heat pumps want to work a bit like that. They want, they want to be on for long periods of time, ticking over, doing their thing, providing some, some stable temperatures. And for me, where the comfort comes from is that 
when you allow a heat pump to run for longer periods of time, you allow everything in that building to come up to that nice temperature, so the, the floors, the walls, the ceiling, and, and indeed all your stuff. Um, everything you're surrounded by also gets to that temperature. And that's, that, for me, is incredibly comfortable. It, it feels, my house in winter feels more like my house feels like in spring and autumn when the heating's off. It's not an instant walking into the house, whoa, the heating's on. It's very much, oh, that's pleasant. But it, it can be quite a hard sell to tell someone to just let it do its thing, because I think we have it ingrained, understandably, into our collective psyche that we need to switch things off to save energy. So we turn off lights, and we switch off taps when we're brushing our teeth, and we do all these good things. And then here I am saying, the way to make this heat pump save energy for you is to, is to leave it on, which, is, which can sound a bit mad, because heating a building to a higher average temperature over the whole winter does require more heat energy. But the trick is that heat pumps are so much more efficient when they're run at lower temperatures that they can more than compensate for this slight additional um, primary, primary heat use. So what about the important thing? Where are we with our, our carbon savings? So this is what happened to, to my plan. There's a 74% drop in the carbon associated with heating my home um, basically overnight through, through one action. And for me, that's what that is what this is all about. And what if I decided um, to stick with my original path? So my original path would have looked something like this. In 2040, we, I would have arrived in exactly the same place. But the difference in these paths is 37 tonnes of carbon emitted into the atmosphere, which, which I cannot take back. So here's a picture of me looking quite smug at the end of 2021 with the ceremonial switching off of my gas meter after I finally replaced my old gas cooker with an, uh, with an electric cooker. Um, I absolutely still believe in my, in my deep retrofit and, and of my building. You'll still find me most weekends covered head to toe in disgusting black suit. Um, but we have, time is no longer a luxury um, we have to address these issues and we just really need to act with a real sense of urgency. Thank you.